All right, it looks like we've got a pretty good quorum here. So Pat, um, if it's okay, I think we can get started. Um, it looks like we've got a really global audience here. That's kind of exciting. I'm seeing people from Vegas and uh, Barcelona, Estonia, it's pretty cool. Um, so today, Shravan and I are here to discuss a couple of topics with you all. So we'll discuss what we're kind of looking for, or what makes startups interesting from the lens of VC. So me as a corporate VC and Shravan as a, a traditional VC, um, we'll also discuss some trend or some, how to successfully launch a product to market and then jump into some trends that we're excited about looking ahead. Um, before we jump into the content, I think we can do some quick introductions on our side. Um, Shravan, why don't you go first? Thanks, Jyoti. Uh, so before I'll give a quick intro on myself and then on IVP, uh, I was at Snowflake actually. I did not work directly with Jyoti at that time, uh, but with others on our team. Uh, I was a PM there for a few years before joining IVP um, and before Snowflake, I was at Confluent and a few other companies. Um, at I IVP, as a venture firm, has been around 42, 43 years. We're mostly Series B and C, um, and I focus on infrastructure software, understandably, given my background. Um, that's a super quick version, and then excited to dig in on, on more interesting topics. Great, thanks. And for getting some echo here. Okay. Um, and for myself, so um, I've been at Snowflake for two years on the corporate development and ventures team. My team is responsible for investing the firm's capital in strategic inorganic growth and also via our Snowflake Ventures arm. Um, since I've joined, we've made nearly a dozen acquisition acquisitions and somewhere in the double digits of investments. Um, a little background on Snowflake Ventures. We were created in late 2020 as a way for us to invest across the modern data stack ecosystem and really look to invest in partners that are leaning in on Snowflake. And um, we'll get into that a little bit in this discussion here. So um, I know that the Q&A is pretty active. I'll try to monitor it as I've, been, um, as I've been doing here and we'll try to answer your questions as we go along. Looking forward to the discussion. Um, I can jump into kind of how Snowflake Ventures is looking at startups and how we think about investing. So um, as I mentioned, we're really looking at investing as a way to accelerate what's already on our platform. Uh, regardless of the company stage, we're looking for companies that are going big on Snowflake in some way. So this helps us further unlock uh, more differentiated offerings. It allows for deeper partnerships across our ecosystem. And really, we want anything that's bringing data products and data sets, which benefit the broader data cloud and the vision of our data cloud. Uh, to sum it up, we are focused on companies who are doing something unique on Snowflake, uh, helping us expand our own market reach and then building out a richer and more diverse ecosystem that's all built within Snowflake. Um, one of the things that's very important to us, or the, probably the most important thing, is we're really looking at areas that are on our existing product roadmap and focusing on those areas um, as, as areas of priority for areas of priorities for investment. Um, Shravan, I know you mentioned you're a PM here at Snowflake, and we didn't, we, while we didn't work together, you've had a lot of experience with that. Um, are there any key lessons learned or um, kind of knowledge you'd want to impart from your time here and your time at IVP and what you can share about building a product out and taking it to market? Yeah, uh, maybe on the IVP side a little bit less than that than building and shipping a product at Snowflake. Yeah. Um, I think building and shipping inside a company is obviously super different from when it's your own startup. And so there's some key dynamics. And the product I worked at at Snowflake was kind of a rebuild of an existing set of features that we had, but in a, in a new user interface. Um, I think the key thing, there are a few key elements I'd mention. And again, this is very much in the context of building and shipping inside of a company as opposed to uh, when it's your own startup. Uh, I think the first thing is like the standard advice that everyone's going to give you uh, is going to be finding that core user, that core problem that really where it's a, so, as someone referred to it, it's a hair on fire problem. Um, I think that's one of the things that I certainly learned contrasting my time at Snowflake with some earlier stage startups that I was at where I didn't necessarily know the best practices, wasn't as, didn't have the team around us to kind of really identify those issues early on. There are problems that are nice to have, there are problems that are need to have, and there are problems that are must have right away. Um, and it's really those latter most ones that I think are the most critical in the early stages. Um, I think you know there are lots of different frameworks, whether you want to use crossing the chasm or things like that. But for me, it ultimately comes down to what, someone, what is a problem that someone needed a solution to yesterday, uh, and how quickly can you get that in their hands? Now, the key difference between an early stage startup and working at a, a company is the speed with which you can operate. Um, so 
a few companies before Snowflake. I was a, I was a first PM at another company. And we were, you know, 30, 40 people, something like that. The speed with which you're going to operate is much, much quicker. And ultimately, that's the biggest advantage you're going to have over larger companies is the speed and focus with which you can operate and execute and get things in the market and ship. Um, when you're shipping within a larger company, there are much different dynamics at play. On one hand, it's really beneficial where you can have more people, where when you ship it, you have more users that are already there. There's potentially less that you have to do in terms of customer and user acquisition. Now, the flip side is you're also much more beholden to decisions that have been made before. Um, many of those decisions were good, but as we all know, uh, things change over time. And so the assumptions that you had when you had you know, zero or a million dollars in, in revenue are very different from the assumptions and, and how you need to build product at 20 or 50 or 500 or a billion, both in terms of the number of customers you have, the security requirements and things like that. So in all those cases, the through line is finding those hair on fire problems but what you're beholden to and what you have to keep in mind as you're doing that is very, very different on, on, on any of those. Uh, Jody, I'm not sure how, if that was in line with what you were thinking. I'm curious if, if there's anything that you've kind of seen from some of the, the companies that are already starting to su successfully build on Snowflake or some of the examples from, uh, from acquisitions uh, in terms of what has led to them being successful that, that could be helpful for people. Yeah, on the venture side, I definitely I think the message that you're sharing about the the product, what problem you're solving, and how how is your product differentiated from all the other products that are solving the same problem? I think one of the things that I'm um, looking at, or when I'm having conversations with different companies, is really trying to understand, okay, what like how did you get to where you are today? What is it that you're trying to solve? Why is this important? Like, how big is this market? How many users is this going to impact? Who are the personas? What are the use cases? And double clicking into that and really being able to tell a differentiated, differentiated story. I think that we are seeing a lot of um, new segments come up or even old segments where there's a, it's a very saturated market. And I think what will be important to distinguish yourself is how you're able to solve the problem better than your competitors or what's existing. Um, a lot of times I'll actually hear, you know, one of the questions I ask is, okay, you know, I kind of, once I understand what a company does, I have a little map of where it fits into, think I know the competitor. So I ask, you know, what are, if people aren't buying you, what are they buying? Or if people aren't using you, like, what are you, what are you seeing? And I think in some instances, people are saying that, you know, customers are now taking things in-house and trying to build it themselves, which I think is also very interesting, especially given the, the macro climate and probably the, um, the need to try to kind of watch budget and spend. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, really trying to establish yourself as how, how differentiated you are compared to your peers. I think that's really important. And I think one question that I'll answer live that just kind of came up is uh, the dynamic on when to launch. So that once you kind of figured out all those factors in terms of what is the core product, what does your differentiation look like, which is in many ways really hard to know ahead of time. And you cannot, you only kind of figure it out when it's in the wild. It kind of answers the question of like, should you err on the side of shipping or waiting? Uh, I personally am of the belief on, on erring on the side of shipping as opposed to waiting for funding, waiting for announcements, things like that, because you know everyone's got a plan until you kind of see reality, I guess is the nice way of putting that quote. Um, and so that I'd, I'd certainly err on the side of, of that. I think, again, the dynamics are very different inside of a larger company. Uh, when you are in a large company, and this is one of the things that, again, the advantages that startups have you can't ship as fast, even if you could build as fast, you can't ship as fast because the downsides of a product uh, not meeting a security bar, not meeting a stability bar are much, much higher than you are at an early stage startup. When in many cases, the people who are using your product are willing to overlook some of those issues because there's some other dimension that you have that is 10x better than what other companies have. It doesn't have to be the whole product that's 10x better, but there's some individual dimension that's 10x better. Um, so they're willing to overlook it, overlook it a little bit different inside of a larger company. Yeah. And to add on to that, um, while I have not shipped product at Snowflake, I am deeply entrenched with the teams who are. And I know that, you know, we talk about um, kind of architectural reviews, product reviews, security reviews. Those are definitely things that big, com big, big pub publicly traded companies such as Snowflake have to take very seriously. But I think on the flip side of that, you balance a startup being able to move fast and kind of bypass a lot of those steps, um, but still getting kind of to a, min a minimum spot or a, as, as Shravan mentioned, a spot that's satisfactory for customers to try to want to use this innovative new product to help accelerate and augment their existing product and, and what they're using today. Um, I, I see that Max, sorry, I see Max is asking a question here about um, 
what what we care about. So I think, you know, the typical metric, so again, depending on the stage, something that seed pre-seed, I think a lot of it is team and really identifying like what your product is and what problem you're solving and how big that market is. Obviously, as you go later stage, the metrics become more important. So things like ARR, number of joint customers, POCs and POC conversion, um, understanding how the go-to-market team is built up and how that helps accelerate the business. Um, and obviously making sure that there's the right team in place to help execute on that product roadmap and bringing things to GA and bringing things to market. Um, at, at Snowflake, metrics are important to us. We do have a different lens in how we invest and the primary um, consideration for us is whether teams want to lean in and build more deeply and integrate more deeply with Snowflake. So we'll actually put together a product integration roadmap with the companies that we invest in. Um, and that's how that's kind of our first ROI, but everything else must check kind of check the box to, you know, is ARR increasing? What's the number of customers for Snowflake? It's what are integrations with Snowflake? What are the joint customers with Snowflake? And what consumption are you driving on Snowflake um, before we consider making an investment? So those are important. Um, Shrevan, I know from your lens, it might be a little different. Yeah, and it's certainly um, it's, it's different on a number of different dimensions. And I'll primarily answer on the Series B and C side, and I, I acknowledge that many of the attendees in this are maybe more at the pre-seed or seed stage, but I'll, I'll try and answer those as best as I can also. Um, on the Series B and C side, as Jyoti mentioned, there are gonna, there's gonna be more of an emphasis on metrics, but it's not an exclusive emphasis on metrics. So I think that's a little bit of perception of people, of investors when you're getting into venture growth or growth is just, you know, we only care about ARR growth. We only care about top line. It's just, it's growth at all costs. and. I, I think certainly many firms that there's like we're guilty of that over the last few years, but I think it's changing now in terms of a little bit more balance. And I guess a quick plug on the IVP side, we have actually have a SaaS fundraising handbook on our website. So you should, that's just available. So you should just go look at that. Um, a couple things just to kind of narrow in on, on specific. So yes, we are going to care about ARR or revenue growth, but the scales of it are different at different stages. So you know, if you are sub a million, the expectations in terms of the growth rate are going to be much greater than if you're 20 to 50 million. That's just an, a natural uh, kind of a natural decay. Um, the other thing I mentioned is that every firm places emphasis on slightly different things for us. And this is also where it's helpful as you're evaluating the different potential venture firms that you may partner with, understanding their incentives around like how big is their fund size? How many investments are they making on a, on a yearly basis? And this applies to everyone at every stage. Um, how many people are available to make investments, things like that. There's a whole constellation of factors that lead into this output of what are the, the metrics and KPIs that they're gonna care about. So for IVP, for example, our current fund is 1.8 billion. We don't make many investments each year. So as a result of that, we are gonna be more concentrated which then means that we need to have higher confidence in the efficiency of a business for us to be investing 20, 30, 40, $50 million in an initial check. If you contrast that with something at the pre-seed stage, pre-seed oftentimes metrics don't really matter as Jyoti mentioned, where it's like a, the best investments or, or the ones that make the most sense are when you have, you can prove there's a real problem, you have some background in there, um, you have an early demo or things like that, which is just kind of like a borderline magical experience compared to something else. And or you have more of a personal relationship with some of those early stage investors. I think that's a really important part is build that relationship early. Um, so that's more on the pre-seed side. As you go into seed and A, again, metrics are important. They're important at every stage, but they're different types of metrics. And so if you're more of an open source company, understanding downloads and activations and the conversion rate from a, from open source into a paid managed service and things like that is going to be a little bit more important. Um, but there's still not going to be paying attention to like absolute ARR. Um, because ultimately, especially with the way the industry has gone over the last few years, absolute ARR numbers at different stages are lower than they were five to 10 years ago. Like series B's, yeah, about five to seven years ago would often have times have 15 to 20 million in ARR on a regular basis. Now that's very much the exception. Um, and especially in infrastructure software, where is where I spend most of my time, a series B investment is very likely to be sub five, sub seven, you know, very, very likely to be sub 10 in ARR, but it's still going to be usually, you know, more than one to two. Again, those aren't the end all be all. Some other metrics that we at IVP care about in particular, we're going to look a lot at NDR. We're going to care a lot about, sorry, net dollar retention. We're going to care a lot about gross retention in particular, uh, especially as the macro environment has changed. And if you're selling to other companies, 
they're not expanding their seats and hiring as much. They're not expanding their budget as much. But if you're not going to be expanding as much, it's, it's even more critical that you're not churning customers. And so we care a lot about gross retention. We're going to care a lot about sales efficiency and there are some very, very basic metrics. Like this is the opposite of rocket science uh, around the error magic number and things like that. And again, most of those are available on our website and many other VCs websites. So those are a few of the different factors we look at. I do want to highlight though, that we don't, and most investors don't reduce a company to just a set of numbers. It is the combination of all those things. And the traditional things that people are going to talk about are like team market and product. Um, and maybe numbers are something that are kind of horizontal across them. There are lots of other factors besides them, but if you want to really boil it down into like simply what people are looking at, it is all those things. And your traction and KPIs for a startup are a reflection of how all those are playing together. Like, are, is it a great team that is working in a market that is pulling the product as opposed to you kind of pushing it uphill um, with a product that's resonating with, with companies. Um, and when those things are really working in a magical way, those tend to, correspond with higher expansion, with more efficient growth, because it's there's a lot of word of mouth growth, whether it's consumer or enterprise, both those things may happen. Um, those tend to tend to be the case. Jody, I'm curious, which of those do you agree with? Which of those are kind of slightly different from, from the yeah. corporate, corporate venture side? Yeah, great question. And so I'm kind of smiling to myself here. So when Snowflake invests, we are not going to take a lead investor seat we will be investing alongside um, a reputable lead investor. So someone like an IVP. So, you know, we're kind of leveraging the diligence that this lead investor is doing around some of the metrics that Shravan mentioned, the financial metrics, so like NDR, gross retention, ARR, um, burn, burn rate, sales efficiencies, et cetera. But for us, um, I think another kind of metric, if you will, for lack of a better word, is we're actually getting a lot of signals from our PM team or product management team as to where we should be investing the feedback that we're getting from customers for all of our partners. Um, I think that's one of the first kind of indicators. And I would say kind of the pipeline um, or the way I look at it is, you know, we're probably not going to invest in a company off the bat that has no integrations with Snowflake and is not working with Snowflake today. And when I say probably, we're definitely not. So a lot of companies reach out and say, hey, like, we'd like you, you guys to think about investing in this round. And our first question is, well, how are you integrating today? So I think for us, that's kind of the first metric, if you will. Um, and a lot of times companies aren't quite there yet. So we've got different partnership programs within our organization. So we've got the startup program, uh, we've got our Powered by Snowflake program, and we've got our partnership program. And I think a lot of our um, investment partners get started in those in those avenues without even thinking about a venture investment. As, as we start to see more traction with those partners, with our customers, um, driving consumption, that really starts to pique our interest. And then we think, okay, is there something more that we can do here that's above and beyond a regular partnership? And that's kind of how how we think about things. And then of course we tie in the, you know, we've got to kick the tires on kind of the more um, business metrics, if you will. But the first thing for us is really, how are we operating together today? Is that going well? Um, and a lot of times companies are already partnering with Snowflake and interested in having us invest. And then we'll look at it and kind of, you know, I think there's a lot of cases where we've seen like, this is good early innings. Let's keep seeing more cycles and reps of this being proven out at more customers and bigger customers. And that's how we kind of think about it. So, yeah, I think I, it's kind of what you're saying. And then it's a little different lens yeah. for specific for our CBC. I'll add a couple of things based off that. So one, it brings up a really great point, which is I think one thing that's been good on the infrastructure investing side that we've learned from the consumer investing side is paying attention to non dollar metrics or non PL metrics, which is what are the leading indicators of a company being successful? So for an infrastructure company, again, if it's open source, looking at things like usage, um, and I know, for example, Snowflake and, and Frank, during the public earnings, a lot of what they're going to be talking about is like remaining performance obligations and other things like that that are reflective of what are people actually contracted to use for it and what is going to be contracted over time. And so, you know, early stage companies aren't going to have that type of uh, definition and maturity on the metric side. But you're going to be tracking things like how are my how is growth rate working from an engagement standpoint for feature X, Y, and Z. So some baseline analytics along the along that front is also really important to us. And I think a second thing, just to agree with Jodi, is like for us, especially again, this being more series B or C, where our products and market, their early commercialization efforts and things like that, seeing evidence of a partnership with a really successful company in the domain that you're paying attention to is a really big sign for us. So seeing that someone has a partnership with Snowflake, if they're focused on product analytics or something along those lines that, that revolves around business data, seeing that they have a partnership with NVIDIA, if they're more like pure play AI, seeing with a partnership with 
you know, X, Y, and Z. That's another one of those qualitative non KPI factors. That is a really important proof point for us. And again, very focused on series B and C most companies at series seed or a or pre seed don't have those established partnerships yet. So it's a little bit of just kind of a natural maturation that happens. Yeah, and I think to your point um, on those earlier stage companies, like I think Snowflake, are, we are increasing our appetite to kind of work with smaller earlier stage companies. You might think, okay, you're probably enterprise grade or SMB, but through our startup program, I think we're definitely interested in having conversations with earlier stage companies and getting them to start building and starting their Snowflake journey um, as yeah early on. Totally agree. And maybe on uh, kind of transitioning a little bit, unless, and we can always come back to additional questions on metrics and KPIs. Jyothi, I'd be curious about, so you're talking about spending more time talking to early stage companies. A big factor that you've talked about is also just partnerships with Snowflake and success on the Snowflake platform. But I'm sure there's certain trends in certain areas that you're paying more attention to or less attention to. Uh, would love to kind of get a, a little quick overview and I'll, I, you know, after that I can provide my own, my own two cents. Yeah, um, and of course, my dog chooses to start barking right now. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, here at Snowflake, I think you guys are really familiar. We want customers to keep their data all in one spot. Moving data around can result in silos, compliance issues, governance issues, you name it. Um, so we've been focusing on that. And I think the next frontier for us is what you've probably heard about, our native apps. Um, so with native Snowflake native apps, you can build data applications that leverage the power of Snowflake. Um, and we really think this will be the next horizon of collaboration. Users can bring their apps to the data rather than moving data around. So again, keeping data in one spot in a governed um, secure location. Um, kind of said differently, our native app frameworks allow developers to build, market, monetize, and distribute their apps to customers across the data cloud seamlessly and securely, which is a big, um, big factor for us. Um, this enables customers to keep building their apps on Snowflake and then just um, and then kind of add more revenue streams, unlock more value around being able to securely collaborate and share data, um, accelerating app development cycles, deployment cycles, et cetera. Um, so this is something I'm really excited about. I know we, we announced it at our summit in 2022. We again um, had a, a big uh, demo of it at our summit in 2023. Um, some examples of this, um, I know it's kind of a, a, a kind of a vague term of what native app is, but so for example, um, there's a product Capital One Slingshot that helps users manage and optimize their Snowflake spend. That's an example of a, a, a native app that's on Snowflake. So um, yeah, I'm excited to see where this takes off. And um, I think it's in early innings, but I think it'll help users unlock more value out of their data and be able to securely collaborate, which is all, um, all what we're about at Snowflake. Um, Shravan, what about you? What are you? What are some trends you're excited about? Oh, well, being an inventor, I think I'm legally obligated to say AI. But I, I'll, try and, I'll try and spend as little time talking about AI as possible. I knew you were going to say that, which is why I went with native apps. <laughs> yeah, fair enough, fair enough. No, I think um, I'll spend a few minutes on AI, and then I would love to spend a lot more time talking about not AI. Um, I think in, there are differing opinions on this. So take this as as one person's opinion, but in many ways. I view AI as more of like a sustaining in innovation as opposed to a disruptive innovation. I think it's partly because if you contrast this with the times where uh, like the shift to the cloud, for example, or from the shift from the cloud to serverless, which I think was a little mini shift that obviously Snowflake pioneered. Um, and that's obviously, that's also certainly a simplification. It doesn't require in most cases a fundamental re-architecture. You're able to kind of transform your product experience overnight by leveraging an, an, an API and maybe doing some fine tuning. And obviously there's tons of research going on and like, what's the right way to do it? How long should your contact window be, et cetera, et cetera. But like 80 to 85% of the benefit is from hitting an open AI API or working with, you know, Snowflake as they continue to expand their experiences and things like that. Um, and so if that's the case, is that really going to be benefiting early stage startups versus benefiting existing companies? And always in every single situation, it's easy to be pessimistic and there are always going to be great startups that emerge. So I'm not trying to suggest otherwise. Um, but I wanted to kind of give that caveat around why AI in terms of what it's going to do to transform the end user experience is magical. Like there are products out there that you can use where it literally feels like that old quote about, you know, any sufficiently advanced science, I'm, I'm sure I'm butchering the quote, it's indistinguishable from magic. Sorry, I totally worked with that quote. But, um, Drop cover, hold on. sorry, I'm getting an earthquake notification. Um, it was a sample one, sorry, it's a total pass. Um, but I think the, the key thing to, to note there is that 
AI in and of itself is not actually the thing that's going to change everything. Um, what it's always going to kind of come down to, um, oh, there's actually a. Yeah, there's definitely an earthquake happening right now. <laughs> oh, okay, I thought that was a fake test. Uh, if I have to drop, I will. I will let everyone up. Um, sorry, the, the key point there is that assuming that AI is going to solve everything is not the most important, it's not the most important thing. It ultimately comes down to a couple of key factors. One is like finding some magical customer experience, and maybe that's uniquely enabled by AI, but I'd argue that the majority of magical end user experiences were possible without AI, and AI is just accelerating the development time for it or accelerating the impact of it. So I think those are a couple things to, to kind of keep in mind. Um, so to kind of shift away from that for a second, some of the very concrete areas that I find very interesting are, are actually on the infrastructure side, and no surprise given my background. What we've seen over the last five to 10 years is like a kind of a very fundamental and step-by-step -step deconstruction of the tech stack that most companies are building on top of. And so we've seen a lot of that on the front end with Vercel's and Netlify's of the world. We've seen a lot of that stuff on like the pure database layer. Uh, so that's happening through Snowflakes on the OLAP side. We're seeing it with some exciting companies like PlanetScale and Neon on the database side. Obviously, the, the core products that AWS and others have provided are really the ones kind of pioneering that. There's kind of a big gap in the middle in terms of what's happening, whether you want to call it the caching layer or routing layer or things like that. So there's some really interesting ones there and that could be relevant in the in the face of AI, it could, but I think it's just relevant for anyone building an application. So I think that's one part that's super interesting to me. Um, a second area that's actually interesting to me um, is a little bit more on how do we interact with the world from an information and knowledge standpoint. And that, so that's a little bit more of a consumer standpoint, and I say that as an infra investor, but I think there's going to be some fundamentally new ways that we interact with information moving forward. And maybe it's some solution or maybe it's some product that spans both consumer and enterprise, and it's like this kind of single horizontal experience. It's more likely that there is something magical that, uh, that appears on the consumer side, which is like this is a fundamentally new way of interacting with knowledge and information. Um, and that's not like a traditional search. And I'm not saying it's something that's going to be headset based either. I would be, if I knew what it was, I'd probably go and start the company, but I don't. But I think there's some really interesting things on that front. A couple other kind of like off the bean path ones that I think would be interesting, uh, and I'm, just, I'm spitballing here a little bit, is like over the last five to 10 years, people have kind of been, there've been significant issues on the advertising side, uh, whether it's some of the privacy changes that Apple has made or anything like that, it's uh, customer acquisition costs have increased. Um, there could be some really interesting things that emerge where someone is using an agent-based solution to automatically optimize ad spend um, and ad placement across all the major networks and things like that. And providing that as a service to other companies could be really valuable. Um, so that's the type of thing where it's like a workflow that is being transformed by new technologies that are, uh, that are enabled by AI. Um, and there's a whole bunch of stuff on the data acquisition side. I think Snowflake's really pioneering that with the marketplace. But anything you can do where you're acquiring really latent data, which is not being used, and finding a way to get value out of that data is a pretty timeless way of building a product. Um, Gong did that with sales data. You know, these conversations, have been, and we're not investors there, um, but these conversations have always existed. No one's just thought to take them and translate them into data in a way that can be used. So I think finding different ways to deconstruct that fundamental problem of like, there is latent data out there in every single job. Uh, in every single walk of life, what are ways we can use it? And I could make the argument that from a consumer standpoint, that's a very similar thing um, to what's happening where people are taking latent data in terms of the world, like from an AR VR standpoint, the world is latent data. It's a fundamentally new way of interacting with it and gathering it through an Oculus, through um, uh, Niantic, where we're investors, through potentially the upcoming like a headset from Apple. So a little bit rambly, uh, figured I'd throw some some, uh, some kind of off the beaten path ideas and stuff that, I, that we find interesting. Yeah, and I think that kind of ties into what I, how we're thinking about things at Snowflake. It's, you know, um, you know, talking about data sets, getting customers and users to be able to securely and collaborate um, on data, their data sets. Um, so, you know, for being able to work with first party, third party data, et cetera, via our native apps, you know, we've got, I know generative AI is uh, the buzzword and our leaders always joke, like take a shot every time someone says AI or generative AI. 
Um, I think what I'm excited about there, obviously all these LLMs have built, been built and trained off of massive sets of public data. What I'm excited about for the future of Snowflake customers is being able to use their own data in a secure governed way and um, you know build LLMs based off of their own data. So I'm looking forward to, to seeing what that looks like. I think it's still early innings and I think a lot of investors are making early bets in this space without kind of, kind of trying to wait and see where things go. But that's definitely a, a trend that I'm excited about. Again, tying back to you know Snowflake being the home for everyone's data and being able to work securely and um, in a governed fashion with, with the data that sits within your Snowflake. Couldn't agree more. Um, that's where my Snowflake bias comes into play also. Um, Pat, um, Pat has a question here. So from your experience, what are the most common mistakes startups make when trying to get funding? That's a tough, good question. Um, I think from my lens, um, I think it's kind of um, starting out with, first of all, you know, <laughs> not being um, built on Snowflake if you're trying to reach out to Snowflake Ventures for an investment. <laughs> I'm being a little facetious there, but um, I think um, also getting back to that product market fit and also how you are differentiating yourselves. Um, I will have countless calls with different players that are kind of in the same space. And I'm like, how are you differentiated? And I'm not able to get that story out. That's been something that's given me pause about investing because it's there's that, you know, there's, you know, 10, 15 um, players in this particular space. You definitely want to be able to make yourself stand out. And I think having that key crisp messaging, you know, it's kind of back to like the, the days of when you were learning about networking and like the elevator pitch. You really want to be able to synthesize what your company does in some basic kind of um, almost bullet points, even though you're, you know, it's not reading off a slide, but um, concise statements on what your company does and how it's solving that problem and how it's differentiated versus what's in the market today. So that's kind of what I'm seeing. And then I think, um, I think, you know, it's also trying to prove out some of these um, earlier stage metrics when it, they're not necessarily available. And I think just trying to, to, to drive the point home there around like the team that you're building, um, how you're thinking about where your product will sit within the market, et cetera. Um, Shravan, curious to get your thoughts on this one. Yeah, I think there are, they're like the standard mistakes and uh, just to give some great examples in the Snowflake context. I think a couple just maybe more minor ones that people don't talk about as much is like the VC network and industry is still pretty small in terms of number of people. Um, and so one of the mistakes you make is trying to kind of reach out cold versus getting a warm intro from someone. And again, like there are cold uh, reach outs from like VCs will cold reach out to companies and companies can cold reach out to, to VCs. You're going to have a much higher conversion rate if you can get an intro. There are some VCs that take a really hard line. Like if some, if I don't know this person and they don't get an intro, I will never take it. I don't know. I think life's too short to, to act like that. But I do think it dramatically improves the likelihood, even if it's not an intro, even if it's just someone putting in a good word for you for, uh, for you at a venture firm. I think that's really critical. Um, I think a second thing that will often happen is you'll have some people who will who are very good at pitching the product today and why it's really interesting. And you have some that are very good at pitching like the vision for how they're going to transform the world. It's hard to do both, obviously. Um, it's even harder to kind of draw a through line for how you're going to systematically do that. And we all know that things are going to change along the way pretty substantially. Like what you believe when you start a company is going to be dramatically different from probably like three months later. Um, but it's still like demonstrating that you've thought through and you understand this, that you understand how the market works, you understand the fundamental customer problem. I think it's that really conveys a depth of insight and a depth of thinking and and motivation really to understand all of that that I think is, I, I think really stands out in a meeting compared to when someone doesn't necessarily have that. And again, there's no perfect answer and it's not guaranteed it's going to be the case, but even just demonstrating that you've thought through that and you have a point of view on it that is different from others is really critical. So there are lots of others that we can talk through, but I figure we, in the interest of time, would stop with those. I know Jyoti, you also want to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about some exciting stuff on the Snowflake front. Yeah, before we jump into that, I do want to give kind of a real life example. A lot of times I've met with companies where they're like, oh, I'm X fill in big name of tech company here, Google, Airbnb, um, Amazon, whatever. And I was trying to solve this problem at my company and I realized it couldn't be done. And that's when I went out to go figure it out with myself with you know two of my other coworkers. And that really, I think being able to break it down in that kind of that simple to follow away. I mean, obviously you're going to be pitching to a wide variety of people. Some will be very, very technical. Some will be lighter on the technical side. And um, I think being able to distill your ideas of what you're trying to pitch to, inv to investors and others will be really important. So breaking it down and like, this is what it is. I think it's like the, the kind of 
um, succinct phrase of what you're trying to, to solve for, I think is really helpful for um, the broad spectrum of investors. Um, yeah. All right. Um, yeah. So speaking of investors and, and startups, um, Snowflake has a really exciting program. It's called our Snowflake Startup Challenge. Um, it's a competition where companies can um, uh, put submit an application and uh, winners are down selected. So there'll be three finalists and those three finalists will get a chance to present at our Snowflake Summit in June of next year. Um, we'll actually be in San Francisco this year. Um, the panel of judges will include our founder, Benoit, um, our CMO, Denise, um, and then we'll have a couple of our other of our investors. So you'll get a chance to get on stage and pitch your product to um, this group if you make it. So um, I consider this group, for those of you who are, who are on the call in early stage uh, startup founders, to consider, uh, to consider, to consider applying today. Um, it should be exciting. We just launched applications a few weeks ago and um, it's been growing steadily over the years. I, the first year we had a couple hundred applications, um, the year after, you know, kind of added. And then I think last year we had something like a couple thousand applications. So it's a, been a pretty exciting burst. Um, so looking forward to seeing some of you apply and seeing you there. All right. And I know a few of you, um, so I am having a sort of office hour um, sign up thing. I think a few of you were given access to that. So to those of you who were on the call and we have a call scheduled for later this week, looking forward to connecting and further discussing how to make a successful pitch. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thanks all.